Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. This We uh, have a special treat today um, in our series on Ukraine. It's um, uh, Serhii Plochi, who is the Mikhail Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and Director of the Ukrainian Research uh, Institute at Harvard University. And uh, we will have a conversation and he will share some of his perspectives on um, Ukraine's history and Russia's invasion. Uh, uh, to further introduce him, uh, some of his books are behind me, but um, uh, let me just read some of the titles. Uh, he has published basically a book uh, per year, almost <laughs> over the last 20 years on an incredible range of different topics. I'd like to just give a bit of a flavor of the range of topics and, and the wide ranging interests that he has. Uh, so let me read a few titles. Uh, the Cossacks and Religion in Early Modern Ukraine, Tsars and Cossacks, a study in iconography, religion and nation in modern Ukraine, the unmaking of imperial Russia, Mikhail Khrushchevsky and the writing of Ukrainian history, the origins of the Slavic nations, pre-modern identities in Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, Ukraine and Russia, representations of the past, Yalta, the price of peace, the Cossack myth, history and nationhood in the age of empires, the Last Empire, the fi Final Days of the Soviet Union, The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine, which is a, a book that is a great place to start um, to get an overview of Ukrainian history. Uh, Lost Kingdom, The Quest for Empire and the Making of the Russian Nation, which is a, also a very good um, book to begin with. Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the frontline essays on Ukraine's past and present, and finally, Adams and Ash as a global history of nuclear disaster. So you can see that Sergei has written about a very broad range of topics, not just Ukrainian history, but also Russian history and uh, the history of um, uh, international affairs. So there are many things that Sergei could talk about today, uh, but I'd like to start on a, a bit of a personal note. Um, and I'm sure I know you have many friends and family and colleagues in Ukraine, and uh, we all wish you and them the best. And um, uh, I'm sure you're not sleeping much and feeling constant pressures. I'd just like to ask how you how you are doing, and if you'd like to uh, to say a few personal things about how this war has impacted you. Um, Eric, first of all, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for this introduction and for this invitation. And um, Eric was one of the first who welcomed me to Harvard back in 2007 and showed the ways around. And we had offices in the, <coughs> uh, in the really the, 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 in, in, in the lowest of the low floors of the Robinson Hall. Uh, so it's, 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 really, it's really a pleasure to, to reconnect in that way. Uh, I wish it would be happening under, under different circumstances. Uh, times, times are really extremely difficult on, on, on many levels and certainly especially for people, for people in Ukraine. Uh, and for us, for those who come from, from that country, for, who study it, who, who have connections, families, uh, uh, different links, um, I, I we had the um, short discussion before we went we went live, and, and I told Eric that it felt in the last few weeks like a nightmare that never ends. You, you go to bed and you hope that you will wake up and somehow it will disappear. And, it, 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 it doesn't. And uh, um, really the, the, the way uh, somehow to, to, to survive under the circumstances is, is uh, not very original one. It's, it's really work and, and what we do, which happened to be also to a degree a challenge. I um, recalled during these days the uh, memoirs of Richard Pipes, another you know, very, very prominent uh, historian sitting at Harvard in his memoirs, Vixie. Uh, Pipes had this magnificent mind and, and the ability to analyze things and, and conceptualize. But when it got to the, to, to, to the Holocaust, the part of his own story, uh, he just refused to 
analyze that. It, it was a black box. It was evil. His mind, he didn't want or couldn't allow his mind to penetrate that, that, that space. And I, I felt to a degree the same way this, this, this the war that started in, with the Russian aggression against Ukraine. But at the end of the day, what we do, we, we study, we analyze, we try to, to learn things, explain things with the hope that um, some lessons can be drawn from that. Because that war for me personally was the, um, the, the, the strongest indication that my deep seated belief that we as a human kind, as a human race, somehow can learn from history. And I, I, I believed deep down without ever articulating that, that we turned pages on, on the worst parts of the history of the 20th century. And uh, what, what is happening now and what has been happening really for the last few years was, was a huge disappointment for me on, on, on the level which was never you know, verbalized to, to a degree, but I, I realized was a deep-seated uh, deep belief. Uh, but I, I, I'm going back to that hope. Yes, again, that's, that's why we are there, historians as a whole, uh, that we will, we will um, eventually one day maybe will help the society to to be better and to turn those pages uh, sorry i was muted <laughs> my fault um so uh there are a lot of different ways we could go with this uh conversation and um i'd like to just maybe start we our audience is not composed of specialists on Ukraine. Are there just a, a few general things that that you'd like to point out that that everyone should know about Ukraine? Maybe some misconceptions that are broadly held that you'd like to just start with um, on a very general level. <clears throat> uh, yes, absolutely. The probably the uh, biggest thing that uh, has been on the mind of, of very many people in the last. Uh, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, how real was the country named Ukraine? Because the, the uh, argument, the, the justification for the invasion, for, for, for killing of people, was uh, on, on the part of Vladimir Putin very much rooted into history. And history was about, uh, he published an article apparently that he had written himself in July of the last year on the historical unity of Russians and, and, and Ukrainians. And the basic premise was that Ukrainians don't exist, didn't exist, and, and shouldn't exist in the future. Uh, that, that, that was really what Russians and Ukrainians uh, are the same people, the, 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 the message was about. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, Ukrainian resistance that caught everyone by surprise really proved that uh, Ukraine is a real country, that Ukrainians are a people and a nation, and they have this, this tremendous uh, courage, but also loyalty to the, to the country and to the institutions, to the democratic institutions in particular which uh, again has, has what happened in the last month in that sense has enormous, enormous importance for today and also for future for perception of Ukraine, which uh, among other things made certain work of people like myself much easier uh, in the sense of that uh, that's, that's, uh, that, that is now the place that people want to know more want to know about, about history, about, about very complex history. And uh, my, my basic message is that it is a very rich and it is very interesting history. It is very complex history as well, in terms of um, relations with, with the neighbors, in terms of the amount of things that you have to familiarize yourself to understand Ukrainian history from, from the Ottoman history of the Ottoman Empire, because parts of Ukraine belong there, to Austria-Hungary, to the Russian Empire, to the Soviet history, uh, 
uh, to, to, to Polish and Central European history, you, you can't really study history of Ukraine without all those things being there. But despite this diversity, there is, there is a territory, there, there is a culture in the middle of that, which is being produced by the interaction of these different um, frontiers, different spheres. Uh, and uh, that that what uh, really uh, attracts me to Ukrainian history on the intellectual level beyond beyond the fact that okay I come I come from there I, I, I was uh, trained not necessarily as a historian of Ukraine but as a European historian but there, there is this connection but again what 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 I'm trying to say that there is there is a lot of really interesting intellectual and otherwise things in Ukrainian history that deserve attention of no matter where you're coming from. Sorry, I wonder if um, you might also explain for our audience a little bit about um, the divisions within or the perceived divisions within Ukraine historically between uh, the Western regions that were historically under Polish and Habsburg rule and uh, other parts of Ukraine. And, and in particular, um, in relation to this assumption and assertion of Vladimir Putin that because people speak Russian, they their affinities would be towards Russia and uh, how the events of the last month may have changed this. And I know your fellow, your fellow Bostonian, uh, Oksana Chavel, said that Vladimir Putin might go down in history as a, a major uh, figure in the nation building of Ukraine because he, he really um, united all of these various disparate parts in, in, um, in, in a, this incredible upsurge of patriotism. But anyway, um, <laughs> if you could say a few words on that general topic, that would be helpful. <clears throat> um, sure. Um, the the uh, history of the, of the states and empires that I mentioned from the Ottomans to Poland, Lithuania, to, to, to the Russian Empire, to the, to the Habsburgs, uh, they left their imprint on, on, on Ukrainian history, uh, on, on the way how Ukrainian cities look like. Uh, you go to the city like Lviv and you're not sure really whether, whether you are in Western Europe and Central Europe and Eastern Europe. So it is, it is a, a history that, that has buildings going back to, to, to the Renaissance and, and uh, Austrian, Austrian architecture of the 19th century. And, and the, the, the Poles were there and the Greeks were there. Uh, and uh, you, you go to the, to the um, East and you, you see the cities that really came into existence in the 20th century especially in the areas of, of Donbass. And, and uh, you, you see in Kharkiv, which, which is now bombed, the, the masterpieces of, of, of the Soviet architecture of the 20s and, 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 and uh, in, of 1920s and 1930s. So, so you, you can see that uh, in, in, um, in architecture, in the way how, how um, what people prefer to drink is either it's coffee or tea. So uh, sometimes people joke that the real division in, in Ukraine is not about uh, language or culture or religion for that matter, but between the coffee drinking part of Ukraine and tea drinking part of Ukraine. Um, so regionalism is part, part of, of, of uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian makeup really. And uh, uh, bilingualism. Uh, I traveled a lot in, in, in my professional life. Uh, I, I'm sure that there is maybe somewhere a place that I didn't visit yet where the language of bilingualism is the same as in Ukraine. Uh, it, it is not in Canada where I lived. It's, it, it's not in Switzerland. It's not in any other place where I live because the, the two languages, Russian and Ukrainian, actually being used interchangeably. Sometimes in the last years on TV, it became almost a norm that one person speaks one language, another another. But in any part of Ukraine, whatever language you, you speak, if, if people realize that you don't speak other language, they will switch to that particular language and they'll, be, they'll explain to you what, what, what or answer your question and show you the way and so on and so forth. 
So it's it, 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 it's really unique, in, in, at least in my experience, and probably there, there are cases like that out in the world. And uh, from that point of view, putting the kind of emphasis that has been put on the language and linguistic differences in Ukraine um, uh, uh, is misleading. And uh, uh, that became absolutely obvious in the last few weeks, where uh, really uh, back, even back in 20, in 2014, when the war started, or the first Russo-Ukrainian war, 2014, 2015 took place, um, Russia very much came to, to Ukraine uh, uh, with this idea of the 19th century model of a nation. If you speak a particular language, in this case Russian, then you're probably Russian, your loyalty should be to Russia. The, 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 the justification was we want to protect the Russian speakers against, against the discrimination or persecution by, by, by the Ukrainian speakers. Um, and and uh, it, 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 it really didn't work back then on, on to, to the degree that it was expected and certainly didn't work now, it, it backfired. Uh, you, you can look at the footage coming from the occupied now cities in, in southern Ukraine, like Kherson or, or Militopil, where people are marching under Ukrainian banners against the Russian tanks, speaking Russian and speaking back to the to the to the to, to, to the Russian soldiers in, in their own language, uh, be, being as Ukrainian as it gets and risking their lives in, 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 that, in, in that confrontation. And another extremely sad irony of this whole situation that the justification of the war was about the protection of the Russian speakers, but it's exactly the Russian speaking cities like Mariupol that is now being, being uh, almost wiped out from the face of the earth with the bombardment. Uh, so, one thing that certainly uh, dies in this ruins of, of uh, Mariupol, of Kharkiv, which is being bombed, is this idea about uh, uh, big Russian nation that is that is somehow encompasses all Russian speakers. Uh, Ukraine responded back in 2014 and responds today to this aggression by really uh, demonstrating what the civic nation is about, which is uh, united with state. So the language is not an issue. Both languages are used by uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and by Ukrainians who resist this aggression. Um, so it's, it's the, the kind of a nation that you, you read about in the textbooks that there is supposed to be a civic nation and political nation, but then you go around the world and you have trouble really finding one. It would be purely civic. Well, uh, in Ukraine, this is the closest to that to that model, ideal model that we read about in the textbooks that at least I have seen. Again, um, uh, it's 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 right there. It's it's on TV in front in front of you on, on your screens. It's just. Russian speakers population of South Ukrainian cities uh, dying in defense of, of, of Ukraine and Ukrainian statehood and uh, the, the, the basic the basic idea it's also institutions so another thing that comes from the textbooks uh, because it, it is about it is about institutions which are democratic what that war showed also something that is almost unprecedented in Ukrainian history. It's the level of unity between the people uh, that are governed and the, the, those who govern them. The, the most popular figures in this resistance today are the mayors of the cities and the governors of the regions. They're, 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 they're true heroes. They're, they're, they're being targeted. They're being kidnapped by, by the Russian occupying forces. And the people are marching there, people that you see that they're marching in defense of their mayors. And this is a very new development for Ukrainian history because I talked about the history of Ukraine as a history of multiple states, empires, and, and, and territories, and, and architectural styles, and languages, and so on and so forth. 
where, where the, the, the authorities were uh, somebody else, that where the authorities were not elected, where the authorities were part of, the, of the, um, some empire, some, some outside force. And uh, uh, it, it, it's almost a part of the Ukrainian political and cultural DNA has been till now, at least, the, this distrust of the authorities. And uh, what, what I have seen in the last few, few weeks really, really caught me by surprise as a historian, because you see that in front of your eyes, something really very really important happens, something demonstrates uh, and, and manifests itself, something that I, I wasn't able to find in, in before in all, in all my historical research, or at least, at least not to that level, to that degree. That's very interesting. And um, I, I guess we can now see that a lot of these trends were really began as early as 2014 after the, the um, intervention. I, I just recently saw a talk um, about civil society in Kharkiv, and it was really quite impressive how a, a sort of uh, non, you know, uh, as you say, a multilingual civil society has been flourishing uh, there. But it's interesting to hear that that it was still a bit of a surprise. Um, maybe if Vladimir Putin had read Linda Kali and some other theorists of nationalism who uh, argue that external wars can unite otherwise disparate, you know, uh, peoples, maybe he would have had a different approach. Uh, well, uh, there is no question about, about the, the importance of war in the formation of modern nations. Uh, we historians and intellectuals in general uh, tend to focus on ourselves, on, on the research and the ideas and so on and so forth, but it's, it, it, it's the dramatic and tragic developments like that that really, really unite people and unite societies. Uh, uh, but uh, also, uh, I, I want just to, 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 to stress once again what you just said that um, the fact that we see that now means that these things were already happening, the processes were happening before, maybe they were not so visible, there were maybe signs of that. So really what, what, what we see now is the product of the last 30 years of existence of Ukraine as an independent state, but more than anything else, of this last, last uh, uh, what is eight years, since 2014 till, till now, till today, uh, I can just tell you my 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 own personal part of that of that experience is that um, you, you, you first of all thank you thank you very much for, for having those books behind you and also for listing them uh, and and uh, the, 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 they were written in English published in, in English and um, they, they were discovered in Ukraine really after 2014 and all of them were translated. And that is not so much about those books, uh, but this is about this, this enormous interest in history, the appetite for history, that uh, the war, the start of the war in 2014 really generated. And I, I want, uh, I want to, to, to think, of, or to say I have no other explanation of, of today's phenomenon uh, as just to say that, okay, there was not just interest in history, that there was, there were, that, that was just one of the signs of the deeper uh, processes that were happening and taking place in which the regionalism, which, which still is a factor of, of Ukrainian life, but became <clears throat> much, much less important factor much more, less divisive factor than it was before. And uh, uh, we at the uh, Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University have a um, project which is called MAPA Digital Atlas of Ukraine, where we uh, uh, have a number of modules. One of them was the, the uh, placing on the map and observing that in time, uh, attitudes of Ukrainian population toward the history of historical personalities or, or uh, Russia or West or membership in NATO and so on and so forth and seeing how it changed, didn't change once we crossed the 2014, 20, uh, 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 2015 uh, line. 
and uh, we placed that on the map. And the, the, the most surprising maps that, that we got, we didn't create them. They were out there. Those were the maps of two <clears throat> presidential elections in Ukraine. <clears throat> Sorry, one of 2014 and another of uh, uh, President Zelensky, it seems to me it was 2019. And uh, uh, the, the uh, President Zelensky and his predecessor, uh, Poroshenko, couldn't take more more different kind of lines and approaches and many things. But what is interesting about the maps that both one candidate, a presidential candidate, and then another carried 90% or roughly or a little bit more maybe of, 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 of all the regions of Ukraine. Before 2014, the map of uh, electoral map of presidential elections in Ukraine looked like the map of presidential elections in the United States today, except that it was worse. The country was divided right in the middle. And that division disappeared in 2014, at least when it comes to the presidential elections. And we see now uh, in what is happening today that it wasn't just the presidential election that was a marker of the, of the changes, quite dramatic changes that happened in the last eight years. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, you're welcome to uh, post them in the Q&A function and we'll get to them um, a little bit later on. Uh, I, I'd like to... Um, uh, pick up on uh, this theme uh, and maybe switch a little bit to the Russian side of things. So you've written extensively about the Russian empire, the Russian nation. Um, obviously, it's early in the game, but this, this is clearly going to have enormous implications for the nation building project of Russia, which it turns out it looks like um, it's more of an attempt to go back to the empire building projects than, than the actual nation building project, but in complicated ways because of the ethnicized vision of, uh, of what Russia is that, that Putin chose in the last uh, month. Um, there are a lot of different sub subtopics and you're welcome to pick any of them, but one of the more interesting ones that's unfolding right now is the, uh, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. And um, uh, if you have anything specifically to say about that and some general things to say about the, the whole nation, Russian nation building, empire building projects, uh, that would be great. Sure. Uh, uh, well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for this question. I, I can't agree more that what is happening now will have enormous impact, not just on Ukrainian nation building, but also on, on what is happening in Russia and in, in Russian national identity project. Uh, because uh, what we have uh, in, in the, the way how the uh, whole issue is formulated and the goals in the war have been formulated by uh, Vladimir Putin, it's a model of what uh, our colleague Alexei Miller called the big Russian nation. Uh, the, the product of the Russian imperial thinking which uh, thinks about um, Russia as uh, and Russian nation, modern Russian nation, as a three-partite um, entity. There's the great Russians, little Russians, or Ukrainians. That's, that's how they were called uh, in the imperial times, and white Russians, or Belarusians. And um, that, um, that project uh, was all but uh, buried by, by the revolution of 1917. So to, to rebuild, reinstate, uh, regain control of the former empire, the Bolsheviks had to recognize the Ukrainians and the Belarusians as separate nations. Uh, even beyond that, so the republics were created, the territory was there, the institutions, uh, so a degree of autonomy was granted as well. Uh, and uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, we have the return of this imperial vision of what the Russian nation is. And uh, it's, it, it survived in a number of, of um, ways and forms and, and, and was brought into the post-Soviet era through a number of channels. And one of those channels was, of course, the 
uh, uh, Russian dissidents of the nationalist uh, nationalist brand or, 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 or direction like uh, Solzhenitsyn. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who is of course one of the one of the uh, Putin's heroes, and uh, his thinking in 1990 and his uh, proposition that he put forward in the article "Kaknam uh, Abustroyet Russia: How We Should Restructure Russia," was that the future Russian state was supposed to include Eastern Slavs, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and at that time mostly settled by them, northern part of Kazakhstan. So in uh, uh, trying to, to pass the Ernst Gellner's test for, for what is nationalism, and the main political principle is the, that the national or ethno-national borders coincide with political borders. Uh, Solzhenitsyn, of course, uh, voted for, the, for the, this imperial model of the, of the big Russian nation, with Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians being within one political entity, within one political body. And that is, that is certainly what, what uh, uh, Vladimir Putin clearly believes in. And that's, that's, that's the model that is being actually uh, really, really uh, destroyed in the ruins of Mariupol and, and, and Kharkiv. And, and it's, it's the, the destruction of that model uh, is happening not just in the, in the minds of the Ukrainians, where for generations that will not be forgiven. Uh, or, or forgotten, but but in the mind of Russians as well, who who uh, uh, I understand that many of them certainly believed in that kind of ideas and propaganda, and there were expectations that the Russian-speaking Ukrainians would be welcoming the advancing Russian troops with flowers, and um, they they are welcoming them with javelins. And if uh, that uh, doesn't make an impact on, on the understanding of where Russia starts and where Russia ends, I don't know what, what would make. But um, returning to, to, the, to the question that you asked about the Russian Orthodox Church, because uh, that's, that's another very important um, channel through which the ideas, the imperial ideas, including the ideas about the uh, uh, one big Russian nation, were, uh, were uh, uh, transferred into the, into the post-Soviet uh, uh, space because the, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, was prosecuted and then uh, persecuted and then tolerated uh, during the Soviet times, but in the conditions where certainly any, um, any developments, uh, theological or otherwise, were really arrested. So it's, it's really remained in its imperial, uh, an imperial institution more than any other institution uh, uh, in, in that, that, that survived the, the, the Soviet era. Uh, the Russian uh, uh, Bolshevik party renamed itself in 1925 into the uh, all union uh, Bolshevik or communist party, communist party of Bolsheviks, and then in 1950s into the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the Russian Orthodox Church never became the Orthodox Church of the, of the Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, or the All Union Orthodox Church. So the, the model of the Russian nation, which consists of, of these three groups, uh, uh, continued into, into the Soviet and then post-Soviet period. And what we see for the first time now, which, which is also shocking, really, uh, is is the split within the Russian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate to the degree that I couldn't imagine a, a few months earlier, where you have um, the uh, um, patriarch who is the, 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 the supposed to be a spiritual father of all members of the church, uh, and there are twelve thousand parishes of the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. Uh, and he takes a position that uh, basically blessing the, 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 the war, supporting the war, talking about the, 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 the decadent West and the gay parades as, as the test for the, for the uh, who, is, who is on the right side of history or not. 
And uh, you see that there were even among the most loyal uh, supporters of Patriarch Kirill in Moscow, including the, the leader of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Moscow Patriarchate, Metropolitan Onufri, who in, in, in Ukraine was perceived as, as, as a, almost a Russian puppet and certainly a loyal supporter of, of a Patriarch, who, who uh, uh, in the first days of the war issues an appeal to to Patriarch Kirill, to Vladimir Putin, and talks about the uh, uh, sin of Cain, of Cain, Cain's sin. Uh, uh, the, uh, in 15 apartheids, they, they, they stop, they stop um, 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 referring to or mentioning the name of Kirill. And there is a movement for, for either autocephaly or a number of parishes and uh, monasteries as well joining the Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church and the Constantinople. And uh, again, that's, 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 uh, the, 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 that is a very profound, almost unexpected change, again, expected under the circumstances. But uh, one thing that once shifts like that started happening in the church, the, the, one of the most mm, traditional and conservative institutions and communities, uh, the, 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 these things uh, make impact for, 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 for generations, for centuries. And uh, I think I would be really very surprised if, uh, as a result of that war and in particular the position taken by Patriarch Kirill, if uh, uh, Moscow would not lose all or maybe the majority of its parishes in Ukraine. This, this, of course, major impact on the, on, 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 uh, the identity issues, both in Russia and in Ukraine. It's, uh, as historians, you know, you, you, one looks for what the long lasting impacts will be of this war and wow, I mean, in the Orthodox world, this is, is obviously something incredibly important is happening and very rapidly. Um, Unbelievable. Are there are there other sort of major your, with your historian's antenna up, <laughs> other major long term shifts that you can see uh, uh, occurring right now that you'd like to point to? Uh, well, uh, looking looking at the at uh, Russian uh, Russian Ukrainian relations, this is certainly a milestone. And uh, and uh, uh, that's that's the uh, mm, mm, really something that 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 will, will stay at least with this with this generation, the generation who ended up on the bombs, who ended up sending their sons and, and daughters in, 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 into the into the uh, army, um, uh, those who. Uh, Got got enlisted in, 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 into the army. The, the, what I hear, and this is anecdotal, so I, that I, I encourage you to check that. But I understand that the lines lines to the to the uh, military uh, recruiting um, offices, the, 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 the military commissariats are, are still there. There are more there are more people willing to join the Ukrainian army than there are arms out there. Um, so it's, 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 it's a profound impact in, in that sense. Um, but I also think about, about the, the impact on uh, broader context, European context, and global as well. Um, because um, what I see is really return of many elements of the Cold War that um, we thought that again that that was another page that was turned with uh, the uh, germany deciding on increasing the military spending doubling this Poland deciding to double the number of troops uh, in, in, in in its armed forces with the nuclear arms race picking up speed we are in a very different place now Again, it's not like we got it just in the course of the last months, certain processes were already there, were happening, but it, it certainly 
they, they certainly became, became very obvious. We are in a different place, we are in a different world. The peace dividend that came with the fall of the Berlin Wall has been, has been spent. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we are in uncharted waters in many, in many ways, which are maybe more dangerous than the, the days of the Cold War, given that the Cold War already came at least by the 60s and 70s of the, after the Cuban Missile Crisis with some sort of uh, rules and written rules and, and, and expectations and norms, and we have none of that today. The, uh, in the first time in the history of warfare, in the first time in the history of the world, the war is taking place on the side of the nuclear power plants. It could happen to the three. Now, it never happened before. There were two attempts to take over nuclear power plants. Those were by quote unquote non government organization, one Maoist group in Argentina, and then the supporters of the um, American uh, African National Council in South Africa. And in both cases, those nuclear power plants were still under construction. They were not functioning. We have shelling of the nuclear power plants in, the, in, in Ukraine today. Um, that's, 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 that's a new world. And it's 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 a new threat that no one no one really was seriously thinking about. And the question that is certainly very very uh, right there in my mind after writing history about a book about Chernobyl and now about nuclear disasters, atoms and dashes is. What does this mean for our debate about nuclear energy and climate change? The, potentially we have now 400 or 440 nuclear reactors all over the world, which are basically sitting there to be turned into the dirty bombs. Um, so again, the, the, the impact the impact of what, what happened in the last month, month uh, in the few weeks is, is really very difficult to assess, but already what we see ha will have a major impact that goes beyond, beyond Ukraine or just relations between Russia and Ukraine. And of course, the the 1994 um, uh, decision to relinquish nuclear weapons has been brought back into the discussion. Um, it left Ukraine without um, that, you know, horrible but very effective um, and deterrent. Um, yeah. And there, there are so many questions about the nuclear side of things. And um, I highly recommend uh, Serhii's book on Chernobyl. It was. Um, a, a very major event in the rise of Ukra the Ukrainian national movement. And uh, so nuclear has always been sort of very front and center in Ukraine. And, and the, the other side that um, is striking about this conflict is that Russia has always used small scale tactical nuclear weapons in their war games as um, uh, almost as a normal sort of next step in their war games. And I'm sure this has been on your mind and others in Ukraine as, as the, um, the frustrations mount with the lack of progress in Russia and the like. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, one other, I'd like to raise a sort of go in a different direction. Um, I, I remember from taking classes with your predecessor, Roman Sporluk, he would, he had this phrase, he always had these bon mots and he, he would always say, Russia was a problem. But Poland was enemy number one, and <laughs> and the reason historically is that um, it, for much in much of Ukraine, most Ukrainians were peasants, and the landlords were were Polish, and there are many other reasons why it was a very difficult history, culminating in extensive intercommunal mass violence in World War II. Um, just in the last month, we've seen over two million refugees uh, welcomed with open arms in Poland, and I wonder if you might say something about the kind of miraculous historical turnaround in a way of uh, Ukraine and Poland becoming such close partners and uh, such wonderful relations after such a terrible many century history. Well, um, well thanks for this question. I, I think that um, in, in, in Polish Ukrainian case, we had too much of history <laughs> and and uh, that, that history is, uh, uh, has been, again, for, for 
very different kind. Um, one of, of professors um, at Harvard, and I don't know whether you took any classes with him, Igor Shevchenko, uh, wrote uh, on that subject, and one of his essays were, was on the uh, role of Poland in Ukrainian history. And that was about early modern uh, history and about bringing the ideas associated with Renaissance and, and, and culture and education and so on and so forth. And, and then there were, of course, very, very, very tragic parts of that story. And um, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, especially in Poland, uh, the, the, the emphasis were on the tragic. The, the emphasis were on the animosity, and um, uh, that that became really a government policy at some point in Poland, and that was certainly policy of certain circles in, in Ukraine, not not of the government, which really poisoned relationships. And uh, uh, suddenly, again, we were talking about many surprises. Suddenly, it all evaporated. Suddenly, it turned out that it was just part of politics, part of, 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 the, of, the, of the language that helped politicians to mobilize their electorates. But when it came to the key issues of the security, because the Poles understand that they can be next, uh, the, the principles of solidarity, principles of um, cultural ties and commonality. Suddenly all of this uh, uses and abuses and misuses of history were moved into the footnotes. Uh, didn't disappear altogether, but became much less, less important. And like with, with other things that we discussed before, we see now this dramatic change, but with like all these changes, they were, uh, in, in the works for, for, for quite a while. Because if you look at the, at the number of the um, Ukrainian uh, migrant workers in Poland, even before the war, even before that crisis, they were in hundreds of thousands of people and the uh, Poles for whatever reasons preferred to hire Ukrainians than others. So there was that, 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 that underlying connection that was already there, that was less visible, that also became one of the reasons why so many people went to Poland because they had already the friends connections, that they, 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 they knew where to go, where to stay. But the response, the, the, the response of average Polish citizen was just, just unbelievable and, and still is amazing people, not just in those areas near the border, people were driving for hundreds of kilometers to the border to help people to pick to pick up uh, families to, to, to host them. Uh, it's the, the, the war really, really, uh, I, I read those, those uh, things before, not really fully understanding them, but really the war is is, is, is uh, really uh, demonstrating or can demonstrate or brings in, in people both the worst and, and the best. And, and this, this uh, uh, Polish story of that war, which is, uh, I think, doesn't get enough attention and appreciation, is about bringing up the best. Absolutely. And it's not just Poland, of course, so Romania and, yes. and Moldova yes. and yes. many, many countries have really stepped up and it's, it's, it's been very inspiring. And, and in Poland, it came literally weeks after denying Syrian Kurdish refugees at the border entry. So which, is, which, <laughs> raises, which raises, of course, very important questions. And uh, re regarding Moldova, uh, uh, um, proportionally, percentage-wise, in terms of the population, and this is the, the uh, arguably the poorest country in the in the uh, in Europe, they took most of the refugees. Again, not not in absolute numbers, but in terms of the of how many people they have. So again, uh, absolutely, it's it's not only Poland. The majority of the refugees are in Poland, but it's it's a broad broader phenomenon. Right. And there, there are a lot of ways to donate to the um, uh, refugee organizations. Uh, yes. they, they need they need everyone's help. Um, and I, I have some students who are uh, planning to volunteer to go over and, and work with refugees this summer. 
Um, I'd like to turn to a question from um, Hope Harrison, who's a professor at, at George Washington University, uh, who says that uh, her class just read Gates of Europe, um, the history of Ukraine, and um, uh, found it very helpful. And so her question is about uh, the discussion of Ukrainian neutrality as part of a potential peace agreement um, and what your view on the long-term impact might be if Ukraine did uh, accept neutrality. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, thanks, thanks for, for reading for, for reading the gates of Europe, and I, I hope that you, you had you had an interesting and productive discussion. Um, in terms of neutrality, uh, uh, the, this is this is the, the the idea that has been around for for quite a while, and um, um, Henry Kissinger, among others some time ago already was was putting it and, and proposing it. And uh, Austria and, and to, to a lesser degree Finland was was mentioned in that context as well. And uh, I always was and continue to be very skeptical about the, the idea of the of this classic type of Austrian uh, neutrality where the country is actually doesn't have an army. Uh, that kind of neutrality comes uh, uh, in the conditions where the, the both sides, the countries between them and is neutral vis-a-vis -vis one side and another, but the both sides actually agree that this country has the right to exist. And both sides agree that they will not try to encroach on its, on its sovereignty. And uh, this is not the case with Ukraine, where the uh, Russian leader actually denies the right of the country to exist, or doesn't believe that that nation exists, and, and historically or otherwise, and that means that means that in, in, in the modern world, the state itself has no has no legitimacy whatsoever. So. Neutrality based on that on that foundation, so on that ground, is just opening the door for for a future invasion. And uh, what is being proposed now is uh, by the president of Ukraine, in particular Zelensky, is is uh, basically the, the the kind of neutrality that can is as far away from uh, the Austrian model as one can imagine. So it's 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 a, a sort of an armed neutrality that Ukraine keeps its army, and the guarantee is that the Western allies really will resume the supply of the weapons and support in case the country is attacked as well. Again, because in ukrainian case there is also another another uh, reason to be extremely skeptical about neutrality or any piece of paper which which guarantees it the name for that is budapest memorandum of 1994 where the uh, united states uh, britain france uh, russia um, um, made assurances with regard to the uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and in, in territorial integrity. And one of the guarantors, of course, attacked Ukraine once and, and, and then again. And uh, other guarantors or, or countries that made assurances uh, under, under the conditions of the agreement, they had the right to intervene, but they, they didn't have to intervene, and they didn't. Um, and this is this is 1994, uh, the, the memorandum in exchange for Ukraine giving up the physical control over the nuclear weapons, the third largest arsenal in the uh, uh, world. And then 2014 and now 2024 with uh, Ukrainian cities being bombed and, 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 and civil population dying. Um, it's it's a it's a tough sell of, of anything that that uh, smacks of, of uh, neutrality and a big distrust of any sorts of assurances. 
we also have a question from Mark Ponar, Pomar. Uh, it's, a, it's a very common question, uh, what might have led Putin to this decision? And uh, I think, you know, one, one kind of question, the, a, a way to frame it might be, were there underlying forces that would have led to some conflict of this nature without Putin, with a different leader in Russia? Or, or was is this simply his decision and unlikely with someone else in power? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we all believed, or at least I believed, that that uh, um, history ended on a certain level. Not, not not maybe exactly the way how Francis Fukuyama formulated that, but that that uh, we uh, the the sort of a war that we are having today, the annexation of other, other, other um, countries' territory, um, the, the, the level of authoritarian regime that, um, the, the level in which authoritarianism is today in Russia really belong to the past. Um, that, that, that was wrong belief. Um, and uh, now when I'm, I'm trying to look at that, at that entire story, what I see really is that uh, the Soviet Union and, and the fall of the Soviet Union didn't end in 1991. The, the, the fall of the USSR is not an event, it's a process. We are now living through the continuing collapse of the Russian Empire which was saved uh, by, by degree of violence and degree of accommodation by the Bolsheviks uh, back in, the, uh, in uh, 1919, 1920, 1921. It was given a new, new license for life and then, then started collapsing again. So um, uh, Judge Cannon was right in that in 95, that, 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 that was the biggest surprise for his life that normally imperial collapse is gradual. And that happened within a very short period of four, four years. Well, um, I'm now looking at this as a, as a process like the process of the uh, disintegration of the Ottoman Empire that really started in the, uh, in the um, in late 17th century and then going through the 18th century into the Eastern question in the, in the 19th century. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's, it's the wars of, of, the, of, the, of the disintegration of the empire, which was not particularly something, something new for the, for the world from that point of view. Again, the, the, the uh, role of individuals is important, but is not all important. Uh, resentment, resentment after after the um, let's name it the way how it was the loss of the Cold War. Look, look at Germany after after the the loss of in World War One. The situation is the same. The country was not occupied, left to its own devices went through the period of short period of democratic development and then then the, the uh, economic economic crisis uh, in, in Russia it's 1998 just turns turns the politics and, and move, puts them in, into a different direction this is not of course to to deny the agency of, of Vladimir Putin because I think he is, uh, exceptionally capable of providing the, the most harmful foreign policy toward Russia that that one could imagine, and I think this is this is also his his personal responsibility, not just the, 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 the terrible things that he does to Ukraine and to neighbors and so on and so forth, but what he does to Russia. So yes, there is there is there is uh, his his personal responsibility for for all of that. But uh, there are also this broader broader processes that underway. At least in my in my reading, it is and it is about laundry process of the disintegration of the Russian Empire. The Ottoman Empire really did it probably the last the the the, the, the last uh, battles of it were at the end of the. Uh, 20th century with the Yugoslav wars. This is mm -hmm. still 
this is still the continuation of the same story that started in the 17th century. So along the way, things that, that that's that's I think I, I find that this person is the most the most useful in terms of explaining what is happening around us today. That's interesting. The other day, I was trying to come up with uh, examples of empires that lost territories then tried to reconquer them successfully, and the list was very short. It was basically World War II. Um, well, uh, Russian Revolution first, and then World War II, both Stalinist uh, uh, Soviet Union and uh, Nazi Germany. But you know, it's 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 a small list, and um, you know, maybe the fact that Russia appears on that list twice um, is is not insignificant. Um, well, but, with, with the Ottomans, of course, there were ups and downs, but but uh, really nothing, nothing as as drastic as as it was with with Russia and the Soviet Union, because really during the World War II, Stalin expanded the, the, the borders and the influence of, of the Soviet Union beyond anything that was possible or even imaginable during the imperial time. Right, right. So. There's a historical question that um, maybe takes us uh, uh, across the centuries, and uh, it's the use of the term "New Russia" um, and Novorossiya. And it was a it was a project of Catherine the Great to create a new type of rule based in Enlightenment principles and principles of tolerance, um, including um, recognizing Muslim uh, elites and, and rights in Crimea and um, inviting. Uh, immigration to the southern steppe from other uh, nations. Uh, there was a lot of tolerance and multi-ethnic uh, and multi-religious um, uh, approach in it. And it's it's somewhat ironic, I think, that um, this term is being used for a uh, war that is the opposite of tolerance and acceptance of different nations. And I, I, I just, uh, I know you've written about this and have thought about it, so I just thought you, you might want to say a few words about that whole thing. Uh, yes, uh, the, 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 there, is, there is irony there. Um, the way how the term is used, the, the, the argument is that these are the territories that were not part of historical Ukraine, that they were acquired by the Russian Empire and uh, thus belongs to to today's Russia. And again, Solzhenitsyn is there writing about that. So exactly the, 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 this corridor to the Crimea, this Militopol and Kherson, just look at Solzhenitsyn's writings. The, the, this towns, the, the, the cities are, are, are there. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the argument again, like many arguments that we discussed before is essentially imperial. So it is not about, about the people and the population that, that settles that area, those, those who are invited, invited to, to, to be settled there by Catherine. Um, the the um, Crimean Tatars were deported from, from the Crimea. The German and Mennonite settlements disappeared. Uh, deported as well. Uh, the, the Greek settlements are now under, under the fire in Mariupol. That's, that's the center of the Greek, of the Greek settlements. Um, so it's really uh, either, either, either deportations or almost physical, physical extermination of this multi-ethnic and multicultural character of the of what used to be the, the uh, southern Ukraine or uh, part of the provinces that were called it in, in Russia, Katrinoslav, and so on and so forth. And they ended up to be part of Ukraine because at the end of the day, it was the um, colonization by the Ukrainian peasants of those steppe areas that turned them into the, the, the sort of a paradise the, 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 that enlightened thinkers around Catherine II were thinking about. Um, and uh, uh, again, there has been a fair amount of, of uh, cultural Russification and so on and so forth, but uh, we, see, we see where, where the loyalty of, the, of those areas is today, where the loyalty of those people is today. 
whether they are Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians or not, and whatever language they speak. Um, so, in, in a sense, that 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 uh, enlightened dream, to a degree that it was present in the project of New Russia, is is really realized today in, in contemporary multi-ethnic Ukraine, not in the in this uh, post 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 imperial or really imperial aggression. So it's like a twist on the old Chernomirdin line: the, he wanted New Russia and he got New Ukraine. In the south, yeah. Um, great. Um, another uh, historical question, perhaps. Um, have you? Um, do you have any thoughts on like how the Bolshevik conquest of Ukraine uh, compares to the uh, last month? What's different? What's, yeah, yeah, what's, well, what's yeah. Thanks. Thanks for this question because I was. I, I, I was thinking about parallels, and and um, the the um, um, characterization of this war that that, that I heard um, a couple of times was that this is the 19th century war in terms of the, in terms of the ideology, in terms of the goals that uh, fought in the way how the 20th century wars were fought with the destruction of the cities and fought with the weapons coming from the 21st century. Uh, but um, uh, there, there, there were also other things that reminded me about, about this Bolshevik takeover of Ukraine because um, at least from the beginning, there were no front lines and there was, very few front lines during the, the revolutionary civil wars in, in, in the Russian Empire. There were the uh, this armored uh, locomotives who were, who were going along the along the on, on the railroad, and the cities were captured on the railroad one after another. And now there were the, the columns of the of the tanks moving moving on the on the roads so that the war was was conducted uh, during the first months by by Russia uh, the same way leaving huge areas in the in, in the in the rear uh, capturing one city leaving it another so, so leaving it going to another a lot of this kind of a chaos so not, apart from the bombardment and destruction of the cities it was really a very much a civil war revolutionary era Type type of warfare, but there is also one one big difference, and the difference is that when the Bolsheviks normally would get to a major industrial city, Kharkiv, Ekaterinoslav, Ekaterinoslav, or, or, or any other, is the working class most. More often than not, it would be Russian speaking, Russian cultured, and things like that. They would capture that city very easily because there would be there would be the forces there that would support them, and that that helped enormously the the, the Bolshevik takeover of Ukraine. They had the, the the ideology about the working class, about about the class struggle. And they had they had the, the the culture and language on their side side in, in capturing those cities, and uh, nothing nothing like that is happening. The cities are resisting today. Uh, the, the 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 language and culture is 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 is, is not a factor at all, and the the ideology and the appeal of of the. Uh, um, Big Russian nation and, and liberation is 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 not working either. So there are. It, it's almost like the the Putin of 2022 uh, decided to repeat the success of Moravyov of 1918 and encountered a very different Ukraine. It, it changed in the in the course of the last 100 years. Right. Of course. I mean. At that time, there was also a peasant revolution going on, and the Bolsheviks did recognize the results of it. So there, there were there was some some ground, some base of support um, that is just not existent now. And quite the contrary, I mean, the 
Ukrainians have seen what or they've seen what life looks like under Russian rule in the Donbas areas occupied since 2014 and it's not it's not pretty extremely important factor extremely important factor so the the, 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 the people know what 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 the war brings what the Russian control brings it's it's, it's right there it's just called Donbas and uh, I, I, it's it's difficult to overestimate the importance of that negative example. Yeah, and not just Donbas, but also Transnistria and South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And... Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. But, but, but with Donbas, there is just a direct connection. That that's where the families are. That is where the friends are. That's that's where a lot of refugees, millions of refugees from there. Uh, in Ukraine, so that that that's really very 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 close. Um, do you have any um, any thoughts about um, how history might um, inform eventual peace negotiations? It's a kind of a broad question, I know, but the, the there's so many so many historical factors at play here. Um, it's going to be you know, a negotiated settlement of some sort, but. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's, that's, uh, I, I, I certainly agree with that, uh, with that idea about, about negotiated settlement. And, and the most obvious, uh, obvious case is, of course, the, the recent history of the Budapest Memorandum, something that we were talking about. So uh, if it wouldn't be there, I think uh, the, the, the appetite in Ukraine for, this neutral status would be would be much 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 bigger than it is today. So that is that is one uh, um, immediate thing in the in, in the recent history that informs uh, informs the situation today. Uh, uh, another again, what happened after 2014, 2015, exactly what you mentioned, what happened to Donbas is there. So it's it's maybe it's not a fits un, un, under the category of History because it's 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 a memory, it's a memory of this generation. Both both the Budapest Memorandum and and the the war of 2014, 2015, and what happened to Donbass. Uh, in 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 terms of a of a of a of a deeper history, history that that people learn from from um, rituals and textbooks and 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 and, and, and literature. Um, I, I think that uh, a lot of what I hear today is about the parallels between this war and Finland in 1940. So this is not a living memory of people, but this is this is the closest uh, the, 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 this is the closest example in the parallel that a small country can actually, if it is united, uh, can can um, resist and, and, can, and, can, and, and can defend itself. So that is that is one of one of the things that is certainly present in, in Ukraine today. And in, uh, uh, roughly plus minus ninety percent of Ukrainians through all this period believe that Ukraine can uh, can uh, resist and, and, and can can protect itself and, and its 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 independence and. Uh, the degree territorial integrity. Um, uh, how, how many people in, in the first few days believe that Ukraine would last for more than those few days? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am on the panel since the start of the war. Uh, I don't remember one single person. And yeah. they were all good experts. <laughs> So you also wrote yeah, maybe this, like that, yeah. right? Maybe we can end on this. But you um, you wrote a very fine book on the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, uh, one thing about Russia is that uh, uh, things only become uh, inevitable once they've happened, and and they are often hard to predict. And I, very few people predicted the end of the Soviet Union. Right now, there is uh, there are hundreds of thousands of Russian. Um, intelligentsia leaving the country um, quietly, seething and opposing the regime. Um, 
there's there's no way to know what tomorrow may bring or a month or a year um but um uh there are some calls for um uh, cutting off ties with uh, russian culture uh in the higher education and other spheres and uh uh, I, I know Harvard's Davis uh, Davis Center uh, broke ties with official institutions that uh, didn't. Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, I, I don't know if you have thoughts just generally on um, on that topic of, of where the bounds are between the war between uh, Ukraine and Russian culture and, and those kind of things. Well, uh, I, I can tell you what you know that uh, there is overwhelming support in Russia for the war. So the majority of the Russians are behind another question how much information they get and so on and so forth. But it's 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 not just Putin's war. Yeah. So it's a Russian war in Ukraine. It's, there, there is no way around that. And um, I, I I heard from from my Russian colleagues uh, more than once things that I never heard before or, or thought that I would hear. Uh, saying, I, I'm I am ashamed to be Russian under those circumstances. So it's 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 again we, we are in a new place here, a new place that has we, we have to think about, we have to reflect on, uh, and uh, uh, there has been a, a long tradition of somehow separating Russian culture from from Russia, Soviet or post-Soviet or any other. And, and Russian culture was getting, getting a pass where uh, the um, British culture or literature is not, <laughs> never, never getting a pass when it comes to imperialism, to colonialism, and things like that. And th these things are started today, studied today in academia. They're not part of the broader discourse as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, like anything else, that, that that placed in front of us very important questions that we are probably not prepared or not preparing ourselves to answer them. And there is no one one simple one simple answer and, and, and one one yardstick uh, is which we can measure that. But this is this is the discussion that we have to have. We, we can't we can't avoid it. Uh, so that's 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 my, my, my reflection on, on, on the current state of our debates and discussion. We, we should continue. Yes, no, it's a, it's a it's a great parallel to um, uh, British studies and the empire and decolonizing uh, Russian history and Russian culture as a project uh, that that needs needs to move forward. Um, do you have any last thoughts? No. Uh... Again, I, I, I want to thank you for the for, for, for these questions and, and for this discussion. And uh, I, I just can disclose that we, we, had, we, we had this discussion whether it should be a lecture, uh, whether it should be a discussion. And, and I'm really very, very grateful that we, we decided that it would be a discussion. And I'm grateful to you for, for leading it. Well, we know you're very busy right now and have many, many things on your plate. And we're so grateful that you took um, an hour and a quarter to spend with us. Um, thank you very much. And thoughts with you and, and all the best. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.